Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963 thank you all so much for your prayers and support god bless jesus said as a sign of his coming and the end of the age there would be an increase in deception false christ who will deceive many wars and rumors of wars nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes christian persecution apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. In the last days, the prophet Zechariah tells us Israel will be the focal point of world conflict and he gives a dire warning to the nations who would dare come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, 2 and 3 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. This prophecy is unfolding right before our very eyes. Iran is rejecting calls from the U.S. and Europe not to retaliate against Israel for the assassination of a Hamas leader in Tehran two weeks ago. Iran's president saying the country has the right to respond. A senior U.S. official tells NBC News Iran is still deciding how and when. President Biden said he hopes a wider crisis can still be averted if Israel and Hamas agree to a ceasefire and hostage deal. Do you have the understanding that Iran could cease or stop doing a, an action if a ceasefire deal was possible? That's my expectation. We'll see. But there is very little hope this morning for the talks. Hamas says it already agreed to a U.S. proposal a month ago and won't attend a new round of negotiations set for this week, accusing Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu of stalling to keep the war going, an accusation he denies. Israel says it's Hamas that's stalling and continuing to hold hostages in Gaza. Romy Gonen was taken hostage from the Nova Music Festival. Last word her mother Mirav and sister Yarden received is that Romy is alive, but injured, shot in the arm. She turns 24 on Sunday. We thought we will celebrate it with her here. We understand that probably it will not be here together. You just want your loved ones to be safe and to be free. It's like simple as that. Many Gazans say they want that too. These four-day-old twins, witnesses say, were killed by Israeli fire. Their father says he just left them to collect their birth certificates. The Israeli military did not respond to our detailed request for information about the incident, but it has said repeatedly Hamas hides among civilians. As a sign of his coming and the end of the age, Jesus declares, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. The prophets of the Old Testament prophesied of these future military conflicts in Isaiah 17:1, in which Damascus, Syria will be destroyed in a single night. Jeremiah 49, the prophecy of Alam, which could infer an Israeli attack upon Iran's nuclear program. Psalm 83, in which the Muslim nations that border Israel will mount an attack on Israel in order to cut them off from being a nation. Ezekiel 38 and 39, known as the War of Gog and Magog. In this prophecy, a coalition of nations led by Russia, Iran, and Turkey will attack Israel in the last days in order to take Israel's wealth. Israel is still preparing for an attack from Iran and its proxies, while the Biden administration is lobbying for peace. At the same time, the U.S. is building up a strong military presence in the region. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, where Israelis remain on high alert. 
There are reports Iran is preparing its missile and drone units for an assault, just as it did before its massive attack in April. Some in Israeli intelligence predict Iran could attack within days. But the U.S. is still working diplomatic efforts to get Iran to back off. The situation is described as fluid. It's more than just diplomacy. The U.S. has also deployed a vast armada of naval and air assets to the Middle East to defend Israel. But the Pentagon is making clear it's not going on the offense. The United States is not looking to, uh, to engage in offensive operations and, again, potentially spark a wider regional conflict. Our focus is on de-escalating tensions. The Defense Department also revealed that eight U.S. service members were injured in a drone attack on a base in Syria last week. Iranian militia are believed to be behind the attack. The soldiers treated for smoke inhalation and traumatic brain injury. Three are back on duty. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has reportedly canceled a trip to the Middle East due to the instability. But he also approved a weapon sale of more than $20 billion to Israel. On Tuesday, President Joe Biden signed on to a joint statement with the leaders of the U.K., France, Germany and Italy, calling on Iran to stand down its ongoing threats of a military attack against Israel. The U.S. and other mediators are also trying to make sure Hamas shows up for ceasefire talks set for Thursday. Hamas is balking because it accuses Israel of demanding new conditions for a ceasefire. Israel's prime minister says his government has only put forth clarifications, not new conditions. President Biden is banking on an agreement to bring peace to the region. Tuesday, he told reporters he expects Iran to hold off on a retaliatory strike if a ceasefire deal is reached. All the waiting has taken a toll on Israelis. Israelis are very tense, I must say, and uh, it almost feels like they say, hey, you, you either attack us or you don't. I mean, they're tired of waiting. It seems like it's very similar to the Six-Day War type of waiting when Israel waited for three weeks mm -hmm. and, um, well, the time will show yeah. what will happen. Psalm 2, 1 through 12. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Albert Vexler of the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast believes it's a critical time to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. He says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem. So, I mean, is it important? to pray, to remember, to lift Jerusalem as our highest joy, as the Bible commands us? I think it is. Psalm 122.6 Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Praying for the peace of Jerusalem means praying for Jesus' return, as he is the only one who brings true peace when he returns as King of Kings and Lord of Lords at his second coming to the war in Ukraine, Russia fighting back after Ukraine's surprise advance. Another region of Russia declaring a state of emergency over Ukraine's audacious operation across the border. Overnight, the governor of the border region of Belgorod calling the situation very difficult following attacks by Ukrainian forces, saying houses are destroyed, civilians dead and injured. Belgorod, of course, as you know, has been used to launch consistent deadly attacks on Ukraine. Russian troops seem captured and taken prisoner as Kyiv pounds the Russian border region 
region of Kursk, which neighbours Belgorod, with missiles and drones claiming control of almost 80 settlements. It's also struck three Russian airfields overnight, one more than 380 miles inside Russia itself. Ukraine's shock counter-invasion, catching the Kremlin and Putin's army totally off guard. Now they're trying to rush men, munitions into place to try and drive the Ukrainians out. There is some sign of Ukrainian forces starting to dig in while others are trying to advance with fierce firefights reported. A senior Russian military official is now vowing to uh, launch an all-out offensive to drive the Ukrainians out. But this has been a major blow to Putin and his war plan in Ukraine. And I think two key questions. One, can Ukraine hold on to the territory or can Vladimir Putin reassert control of his own backyard? New details about yesterday's quake that rattled nerves across Southern California. Seismologists say it was on a fault more dangerous than the San Andreas and capable of a catastrophic quake. And they say it's especially dangerous because it runs through heavily populated areas. You're right. That quake goes, that quake fault line goes right through downtown Los Angeles. Seismologists here at Caltech say if there was a powerful earthquake along that fault line, it could kill up to 18,000 people. When the shaking stopped yesterday, there were more warnings and real worries. That fault runs right through Los Angeles, which is why we need to be concerned about it. It does uh, it has the potential for a very large earthquake. It's been modeled up to magnitude seven and a half. Seismologist Dr. Lucy Jones says Monday's modest quake was on the Puente Hills thrust fault system, more dangerous than the San Andreas fault because it is perilously close to downtown L.A., a place packed with people and very old, unstable buildings. Higher death toll than we would see from the San Andreas because it is so much closer to people. The fault stretches from the Glendale Pasadena area to Puente Hills and lately has been very active. All that seismic activity has people ducking and covering throughout the Southland. From 2013 to 2023, Dr. Jones says there was an average of five magnitude four or stronger shakers. But 2024 has been a lot more volatile. Already this year, there have been 13 magnitude four or stronger quakes. After Monday's 4.4 magnitude earthquake shook homes across L.A. It was really scary. But um, it was a bit of a shock, yeah. Seismologists are now saying we are experiencing a period of increased earthquake activity in Southern California, one that many people have noticed. A lot more recently and mm -hmm. did feel a few of those, but not nothing as strong as what we just felt in South Pasadena. Yeah. There are two key prophecies concerning Jesus' signs of his coming and the end of the age that are crucial to discerning that we are living in the last days. The first prophecy is found in Matthew 24, 8. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. This is how end time signs such as wars, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes will occur. They will become more frequent and more intense as we get closer to Jesus' return. The second prophecy is in Luke 21, 28. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. Notice Jesus said when these things begin to happen. Jesus was saying that when you see a convergence of Bible prophecy, look up and lift up your heads, because your redemption draws near. We are witnessing not only the convergence of Bible prophecy around the world, we are experiencing the frequency and intensity of these prophetic events as well. This is what many parts of Northern State Sudan's driest now look like. Heavy rain and flash floods have swept away homes and damaged properties. There are some places where torrential floods come during the rainy season, but we were surprised because our area doesn't usually get floods. When the water came into the houses, we took the women and children out and stood on the highway. You can see the situation here. Local authorities say several people were killed and injured when buildings collapsed and power lines were damaged. Since the start of the rainy season in late June, the floods have killed dozens of people and forced more than 20,000 from their homes across nine states. The things we need now are food and shelter because people are living in the open air. There are no houses. People are living in mosques and in open spaces. We need tents, food, water and medicines. Sudan's problems were significant even before the flooding. 
Conflict between the army and the Rapid Support Forces paramilitary group has displaced more than 10 million people and left half the population of 48 million in need of humanitarian assistance. Officials in Northern State have appealed for help. The rains and floods have caused unusually huge losses in the state, including in other counties such as Murrow and Daba. We need urgent intervention and assistance, especially when it comes to shelter. We also need a plan for rebuilding and a health response, because the extent of this damage will cause a health crisis. Every year, torrential rains lash Sudan. But with humanitarian agencies already struggling to respond to what's being termed the world's largest humanitarian crisis, reaching those affected by flooding this year will not be easy. My house is on fire, guys, says the man filming. My house is on fire. Costas shows us the damage to his home, a place built by his father 25 years ago, a place where he has lived all his life. He says the family cannot afford to repair the damage and they don't expect enough government compensation to repair it and will probably have to leave. I smelt a fire and went outside. I looked over there. When I saw it was out of control, I came home and we started soaking everything with water to protect the house. We tried to save whatever we could from our home, the only home we have. Dead animals among the smouldering debris, vast swathes of land reduced to ashes. Helicopters scoop water from the sea and drop it on areas where small fires still appear. When you see the scorched earth around towns like Varnavar, it's incredible that more people were not injured or killed. And when you speak to people here, there's an increasing sense of despair and anger because despite repeated promises by the government every year to do more, the people here say they have to rely on themselves to prevent the destruction of their homes. The blaze swept through the area, destroying everything in its path. Power lines are down, there's no electricity in town. I'm very angry because I couldn't protect my children. What kind of future do they face? We don't have a government that can offer the basics, the minimum. I mean that the firefighting vehicles have enough water. We're in 2024 and we don't even have the basic infrastructure. Robert shows us the equipment he used to save his family's home. The truth is that the fire department came late. The fire was huge. We had to use our hoses to douse the trees and surrounding area with water. Even though we called them many times, they came later. The police came and asked us to leave, but we were determined to stay and protect our homes. Every summer, people here brace themselves for wildfires. And every year, the government tells them, we are prepared. In the northeast suburbs of Athens, residents return to their homes and businesses, many finding nothing but charred ruins. They'd been forced to flee in the face of Greece's worst wildfire this year that came to within mere kilometers of the capital. A huge flame appeared from behind and everything melted in a minute. There was no time to even grab any clothes. All I have is what I'm wearing. The fire broke out on Sunday, some 35 kilometers northeast of Athens, flames of up to 25 meters high fueled by a tinderbox of pine forest dried out from multiple heat waves and driven on by high winds. Those winds have since died down. Authorities say the fire no longer has any active advancing fronts, with firefighters now concentrating on putting out the hundreds of slow burning areas that remain. One person, a Moldovan factory employee in her 60s, is known to have died in the blaze. Summer wildfires are common in Greece, but scientists say climate change is making them bigger and more frequent. Dozens of other fires broke out across the country on Monday, with winds expected to pick up again during the week. The Africa CDC makes a clarion call for action, declaring a public health emergency over a particularly aggressive strain of Mpox. The Africa CDC, or Centers for Disease Control, has declared its first ever public health emergency over the most recent Mpox outbreak that began in DR Congo in September, but has since spread to 
other countries. Over 38,000 cases and more than 1,400 deaths have been attributed to the virus on the continent since the start of 2022. MPOX infections surged globally that year, but Africa has a tougher time responding because of a scarcity of vaccines, which is particularly worrying, considering that this latest strain is especially virulent. These infectious pus-filled lesions are due to the MPOX virus. And according to Africa's top public health body, the speed at which a new, more transmissible strain is spreading is causing grave concerns, causing it to trigger its first ever public health emergency of continental security. Mpox is a global threat. Formerly known as monkeypox, Mpox is transmitted through close contact, causing rashes, bodily lesions and flu-like symptoms. It was first detected in humans in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 1970s. But the latest outbreak has spread to neighboring countries, including Burundi, Uganda, Kenya and Rwanda. In 2022, a milder strain of Mpox spread to over 100 countries, causing the World Health Organization to set off its highest alert. But according to experts, the current situation is more severe. If you look at the period, the most recent period, the number of cases in Africa is more than triple what it was uh, when the peak was declared in 2022. According to the latest CDC data from earlier this month, there had been over 38,000 cases of Mpox and over 1,400 deaths in Africa since January 2022. The WHO's emergency committee will now decide whether to trigger its most serious alarm, a public health emergency of international concern. Researchers found that famine was ongoing in North Darfur's Zamzam camp for internally displaced people, which is located a few kilometers south of the embattled El Fasha town and has an estimated population of 500,000 people. Famine classification is complicated, but the report says it occurs when at least 20% of a population suffers extreme food shortages, with 30% of children acutely malnourished and two out of every 10,000 dying due to starvation or malnutrition. We have a looming famine um, and we need to make sure that we can address the needs of uh, a significant number of the population. The conflict between the army and a former paramilitary ally known as the Rapid Support Forces or RSF has created the world's biggest internal displacement crisis and left half the population in urgent need of humanitarian aid. Since it began in April last year, aid workers say international relief has been blocked by the army and looted by the RSF. Both sides deny impeding aid. Experts fear that even when the traditional harvesting season comes in October, crops will be scarce because the war has prevented farmers from planting. Even where markets have supplies, many cannot afford to buy food because of soaring prices and a lack of cash. Luke, 21-25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. 48 hours after the student-approved interim government is formed, hundreds of protesters are back on the streets of Dhaka with new demands. Gathered outside the Supreme Court of Bangladesh, they want the Chief Justice to resign. Student leader Tadikul Islam says their fight is not over yet. Sheikh Hasina's fall is a partial victory for us. Only when we completely restructure our country and all state institutions, the judiciary, the parliament, the law enforcement agencies, and eradicate corruption from every ministry, will we achieve our final victory. Within hours, a new Chief Justice was appointed. Following ex-Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's escape amid weeks of deadly protests, the country plunged into chaos and disorder. On the streets of Nigeria, children roam around, looking for a meal any way they can. Many of them and their parents have been displaced either by violence or poverty. These conditions, along with rampant inflation, corruption and especially poverty, are said to have triggered the angry protests at the start of August. Compounding the levels of poverty is the decades-old violence that has displaced millions. From farmer pastoralist clashes to Boko Haram, the attacks in the Niger Delta and the violent separatist agitations in the East. For now, 
peace is returned to the streets, but it's not clear how long it will last unless government reforms begin to bear fruit. Banking the drum against lithium excavation. Tens of thousands of protesters demonstrated in Belgrade, the Serbian capital, to demand a halt to a new lithium project over fears it could pollute land and water. This is a planetary moment. But it is also true patriotism to fight for clean water, clean air and a clean land that feeds us all in Serbia. Government officials say the protests are politically motivated and designed to topple President Aleksandar Vucic from power. This funeral cortege is taking the body of nine-year-old Alice de Silva Aguiar to a Catholic church in Southport. Members of the community here feel heartbroken and stunned that such a vibrant girl who loved to dance came to such a violent end. On July the 30th, what was supposed to be a peaceful vigil instead turned into this. Far-right inspired groups rioting, attacking a mosque and police and destroying property. Apparent vigilante justice that local people here say was unjustified and unwanted. Scenes of violence like this rocked cities and towns across the UK. Rioters set fire to two hotels housing asylum seekers with vulnerable and terrified people stranded helplessly inside. Prime Minister Keir Starmer held three emergency meetings in his Downing Street residence and set into motion the biggest policing operation in decades, deploying 6,000 riot-trained officers on the streets of the UK. More than 700 people have so far been arrested, with many sent to prison or facing other punishment. But on Wednesday, as more far-right gatherings were planned, tens of thousands of people took to the streets in a show of force against racism, saying their narrative of a diverse and tolerant country had been hijacked by a violent minority. But it's left many people questioning the source of the underlying anger that fermented unrest so quickly. 44-year-old Genet Mengesha walks a path that's become all too familiar, trying to find food for her family at the local relief office in Adwa. And once again, coming back with nothing. We are now on the brink of despair. I have not received any humanitarian aid for five to six months. They register our names, but then tell us we are not on the list. Only a few people are receiving aid. It's an experience common to many others at Mengesha's camp in Tigray. When federal forces began fighting regional troops in 2020, many people fled here. And despite a ceasefire deal two years later, pockets of violence are still being reported. The ongoing tension and theft of humanitarian supplies have forced aid agencies to scale back. I've been in this camp for three years and am now entering my fourth year. Since arriving, I've struggled to care for my children, suffering cold and hunger daily. Many others share my plight, but we have no choice but to stay here. Nearly one million people across Tigray have been unable to go back to their homes. They accuse the government of failing to guarantee their safety. A situation that's left them caught between unending deprivation and fearing for their lives. By staying here, we are merely waiting for death. We are on the verge of death, praying to God to take us back to our homes. Aid agencies warn that the people of Tigray are at risk of extreme hunger. Many have already died of starvation. And even though most of the guns have fallen silent, life in Tigray is still a desperate battle for survival. Police made it clear that in the eighth week of anti-government protests, they didn't want any demonstration here in central Nairobi at all. Meanwhile, President William Ruto swore in a new cabinet. He'd reshuffled it in response to previous protests. Being appointed a cabinet secretary of Kenya. It now includes three members of the political opposition, which he says makes it more inclusive. Demonstrations haven't been led by the political opposition. Protesters say Ruto bringing them into government and reappointing other ministers perpetuates endemic corruption and shows there's no real change. 
they also want justice for the dozens of protesters who've been killed, and so they're still on the street. So there are groups of about a dozen or so protesters in several places throughout Nairobi city centre. But wherever they gather, the police come and fire tear gas. They're trying to stop any kind of crowd from gathering at all. Kill us! Then police fired tear gas at journalists. Some were hit by canisters at close range. Several were injured including our producer, Patrick Mugo. You can stop fighting Kenyans and start fighting media. And this reporter. We have the right as media to show Where Kenyans what is happening in this country. And now you are, you are, you are showing us that we, do, we, don't, we don't have to do this. This is so sad. We are, where are we heading to? Is this what the police have been sent to do? Medics treating people injured in the street said more journalists were injured than in any other day of demonstrations. Meanwhile, police published a statement saying they recognised the constitutional right to protest and that they'd arrested more than 170 people. It all started over a government plan to increase taxes, which was later scrapped. But demonstrators say they want real change to end corruption and improve services and that the government's still not listening. After almost losing power, President Maduro has vowed to tighten his hold on the situation in Venezuela as post-election protests beset the country. If it falls within my constitutional duties as head of state, head of government and president of Venezuela, I demand from all branches of the state greater speed, greater efficiency and an iron fist against crime, against violence, against hate crimes. Since the highly contested vote, protests have claimed 25 lives. Rights groups say 2,200 people have been arrested in what authorities are calling a crackdown on violent criminals. Maduro blames his opponent, Edmundo Gonzalez, for ordering killings and assassinations. Meanwhile, the opposition have called on people to take to the streets. According to opposition, its own tally of polling station level results showed its candidate, Edmundo Gonzalez, won the election. International opinion remains divided, as many states still haven't recognized the results. Government uprisings are now a daily occurrence in our world. People in just about every nation are protesting, rioting, and demanding their governments do a better job taking care of the people. A man, I believe, who is alive and well today, will soon come on the world scene, seeming to have all the answers, and he will bring a false peace to the nations of the world. Three and a half years after this man comes on the world scene, his true intentions will become known. He will bring war the likes of this planet has never seen. And with war will come famine, pestilence, and death. The Bible refers to him as the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind that his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. What do we know about the Antichrist? The Antichrist has many names. The King of Fierce Countenance, the Prince who is to come, the Beast, the Son of Perdition, the Worthless Shepherd, the Man of Sin, the Lawless One. The first sealed judgment in the book of Revelation is the releasing of the Antichrist upon the earth. Revelation 6, 1 and 2. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. The Antichrist will be evil, yet appear as a savior. He will be outspoken and have great speaking ability. He will have a fierce countenance. The Antichrist will be extremely proud. He will not desire women. He will be a military genius. The Antichrist will be mortally wounded. He will be indwelt by Satan. He will come from a revived Roman Empire. The Antichrist will control a one world government. He will control a one world religion. He will control a one world monetary system known as the Mark of the Beast. It is evident that planet Earth is in the time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The world is seeing death destruction and despair at unprecedented levels. The events the world is suffering through right now, awful as they are, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, there will be a time of severe distress this world has never seen or ever will see again, as we read in Matthew 24:21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as it has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. This time of distress Jesus is referring to is called the seven-year tribulation 
in which the inhabitants of planet Earth, who have rejected God and remain unrepentant in their sin, will face his wrath. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened, seven trumpets blown, and seven bowls poured out. The first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal and the white horse rides, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal and the red horse rides, war will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the third seal and the black horse rides, famine will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the fourth seal and the pale horse rides, death and Hades will be unleashed. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6-8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100-pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to 4 billion. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation. Repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church, you may be at work, you may be asleep, God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.